Good evening and welcome to your Chapter 8 videos on chemical reactions. Tonight we are going to look at what is a chemical reaction, how we can tell a chemical reaction has taken place, and then look at descriptions of chemical reactions and turn them into chemical equations that we will be able to use in later chapters. So what is a chemical reaction? Well, a chemical reaction is just the process by which one or more substances are changed into one or more different substances. So basically, whatever you start with, we're going to put it through some change and we are going to get something different in the end, just like a chemical change, if you remember that from chapter two. So indications of a chemical reaction. How do we know one is probably taking place? First thing you're going to look at is the evolution of heat and light. For example, you strike a match and you get that light and of course we know we can burn ourselves so there's lots of heat that comes off of that too. A lot of times the evolution of just one is not a sure sign that there's a chemical reaction that takes place. So usually we're looking for both of them. When this happens, it's an exothermic reaction. So it's a reaction in which energy is being released. The second indication would be the production of a gas. So the simple experiment of pouring vinegar on baking soda when you all made those volcanoes in grade school, those would be indications of a chemical reaction. You produced a gas, the gas bubbled up and flowed out of your volcano. Third indication would be the formation of a precipitate. A precipitate is just a solid that is produced from a chemical reaction in a solution that we can then eventually separate from the solution. In IPS we saw a couple examples of precipitates that were formed. We did this more when we were cooling them off and they can no longer stay in solution. But in this case, kind of like the picture, you're going to pour one solution into another and a whole reaction takes place and we get a new substance. So a substance that can be filtered out that comes out of solution. And then of course a color change. If it color changes without doing too much to it, like painting it, so the color changes on its own, then we definitely have a chemical reaction. So how we talk about chemical reactions are through chemical equations. We don't just like to read a bunch of words. As chemists, we like to look at simple equations that tell us, us what's in there and how much we have. So it represents the identities and relative amounts of reactants and products in a reaction. We should remember that reactants are our original substances, the things that we start with, and the products then are the resulting substances, or what our reactants change into. So as review, if we look at this equation, we know that anything before the arrow are the reactants, and anything after the arrow then must be our products. What else must chemical equations, or do they tell us? Well, they must represent known facts. So when we write them, we can't just willy-nilly put things together. We have to show that this could actually happen. Um, so we represent, or we try to, in the best of our ability, represent a known fact. They must contain, then, correct formulas of the reactants and products. So things we have to look at. We kind of referred to this back in the previous video when we talked about diatomic molecules. These are really going to come into play now. Remember, our diatomic molecules are our Hofbrinkle molecules. Hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine, making up Hofbrinkle. These all would have a subscript of two. Uh, but these would be ones that when they're by themselves, not in a compound, but by themselves, they're going to get a 2 after them. Sulfur and phosphorus then are also special. Sulfur often when it's by itself is going to get a subscript of 8. Kind of remember that because if you're drawing an 8, you kind of start it as an S. And then phosphorus gets a 4. The coefficients in a chemical equation. 
show us the smallest ratio of molecules or moles. So we're not getting away from that mole. So they don't just, or aren't just there for any reason. They're going to show us a ratio, just like the uh, subscripts in a compound show you the ratio of the elements in that compound. The coefficients are going to show us the ratio of moles or molecules. We'll mostly work in moles but the moles of, of all the compounds that are taking place in a reaction. And they must satisfy the law of conservation of mass, which is why we are going to go through and balance chemical equations. There are some things, however, that equations cannot tell us. They can't tell us how fast the reaction goes. We would have to actually put the reaction together and time it ourselves, or someone else would have to do that to tell us how fast the reaction goes. We can just set it up. It's not going to tell us its speed. It's not going to show us how bonding between the atoms or ions change. How do we get from an element that looks like this to an element, or how do we get from a compound that looks like one thing to a compound that looks like something completely different? How do those bonds change? Which bonds change? How many? What's the energy involved in that? An equation will not tell us that. We can write equations that don't actually occur. They're going to look good on paper, but once you actually start doing them, they actually don't happen. So what we're going to start focusing on is writing these chemical equations. And then we're going to look at how many different types there are, and it's just going to keep building on itself. So we're going to start simple today. So the first thing you're going to often see are word equations. Word equations would be something like, Hydrogen reacts with oxygen to form water. That would be a word equation. It's just a simple description of what's happening in a reaction. It's not going to help us so much when we start getting into later chapters. So what we're going to do is take that equation and put it into a formula equation. So what we're going to do is take each compound and change it into its formula, which is why you've been practicing with that in class and writing formulas. So hydrogen. Hydrogen is H. Well, we can't leave it H because hydrogen is part of our Hofbrinkle molecules. So hydrogen gets the subscript of 2 because it's by itself. It reacts with. When something reacts with something, we put a plus sign, because hydrogen plus oxygen, basically. So the plus means something is reacting. It's going to react with oxygen. So here's our next compound. And again, oxygen is part of our Hofbrinkle, so we know it needs to have a 2 subscript. And then to form usually means that's the arrow. So we had our reactants. They are now going to form our products. So our product in this case is water, which we should know as H2O. Or for you that remember molecular formulas, we have dihydrogen monoxide. After that, we can add to it. We can make a complete equation we won't often work with complete equations, but you may see them, and you're going to see funny symbols after these subscripts in the compounds. So for example, hydrogen in this case is going to be hydrogen, but it's going to be in gas form. So we would put a G in parentheses also as a subscript. And it's going to react with oxygen that's also in gas form and it's going to produce water, which by saying water and not water vapor, we're going to assume water is in liquid form in this case. So other things or other symbols we can use. Of course, if we have a solid, we're going to use an S. Or you may see something that says dissolved in water or aqueous. So if something is aqueous, we're going to be, or put the symbol AQ. Again, this just means it's dissolved. So we've dissolved it in water. 
So this is what makes a complete equation. Again, it's not balanced. That's the next step, as you can see. But it does tell us a little bit more about what's going on. So it's a step up from a formula equation. We will focus on, in on the formula equations more than we will the complete equations, but it's nice for you to know what these symbols mean or how to write one should you need to. And then, of course, we can have a complete balanced equation. So we could have two hydrogens in the gas form reacting with one oxygen. Again, that is gaseous, producing two waters in a liquid form. Again, our next video will get into how we got these twos or how to go about balancing the equation. So tonight, if we can get through this and this, we'll be good to go. So let's try some. I've got three of them. Again, if you get it after the first one, you really don't need to watch the next two. But they're going to be there for you. So practice. Solid sodium oxide is added to water at room temperature to form sodium hydroxide, which stays dissolved in water. First, we got to figure out what is sodium oxide. Well, sodium we know is Na. And then we're going to look at our charge sheets. If you have lost yours, uh, I'm going to try to make more copies and get them to you. These were your bright pink ones that I gave you. Or if you were new to me, I think I gave them to you in yellow. So sodium, look up its charge. It has a positive charge. Oxygen, because remember we changed the ending to ide, so we should recognize it probably comes from oxygen. Negative two charge. Since they're not the same, we're going to crisscross its charges. So we know we have Na2O. What else do we know? We know it's solid. So it is added to water. Since it's at room temperature, we know our water is going to be a liquid. And it's going to form sodium hydroxide. So sodium, again, is still going to be Na+. Hydroxide is one of those polyatomic ions. Again, it looks like we have hydrogen and oxygen. So we're going to look it up on the back. And that has a negative charge. Well, this is a positive one. This is negative one, so they're going to cancel. So we just throw them together, and we get an AOH. We know it's dissolved in water. So we're going to put that AQ or aqueous symbol. So that's how you take a simple equation or a simple description of a reaction and turn it into an equation. Again, this one is not balanced. We will get into balancing in the next chip or next video. So let's take solid calcium. Let's react it with solid sulfur and it produces solid calcium sulfide. So calcium by itself is Ca. And then we have to remember, is this one of our special ones? Is this a Hofbrinkle? No, so we don't have to worry about it. It's going to stay calcium. All we need to do is add the S to say it was solid. It's going to react with sulfur. Again, by itself, is it one of our special ones? Yes, it is. So sulfur is going to get an 8 and we know it is also solid. And it is going to produce solid calcium sulfide. So now you need to know the charges. So calcium is Ca plus two. Sulfide is your sulfur with a minus two. Again, their charges are equal, so all we're going to do is combine them into CaS. So you can see when we combine them, we don't care about that S had this 8 here to begin with. All we're going to do is look up the elements themselves, look up their charges, and then combine them. The 8 will come into play when we are balancing. So don't worry about having lost the 8 right now. The 8 has nothing to do with the charge, only the charge of the S itself when it comes together to form the compound. Oops, forgot that this was a solid. So let's look at the last one. We have solid aluminum metal. 
Aluminum is not one of our special elements, so we're just going to put aluminum, and it is solid. Reacts with aqueous zinc chloride. So we have a compound this time, zinc chloride, so we have to look up the charges. So zinc comes as positive 2, chlorine is negative 1. Again, their charges are not equal, so we're going to crisscross and we get ZnCl2, and it says it's aqueous. So since it's aqueous, we put the Aq. And it's going to produce solid zinc metal. So this time we have zinc by itself, and it's solid. It is not a special one, so it doesn't need any subscripts. And aqueous aluminum chloride. Again, another compound, so we look up each part and its charge. So we have aluminum, which is positive 3, chlorine, negative 1. Again, not the same, so we're going to crisscross them. And we get AlCl3. And this one is aqueous. Again, we will balance this in the next video.